English class was uh, uh, um, uh, something that I dreaded in a very big way. Uh, today, I think, it's called language arts. Um, I was no help to my kids at all in that class. Um, I am a terrible speller. If you guys would ever see my notes here, it would probably look like a different language to you. Terrible speller. I, uh, I am terrible at punctuation. Um, whenever I would give an, an article or something that I would write, I would pass that along to Pastor John because I knew he was, he was a school teacher. And he would, Why do they have to use red? <laughs> he had no problem using red ink, and it would look like he wrote half of it for me. That's how many punctuations. We always had this running uh, uh, discussion about the use of commas. Um, I was someone, it, it seems like I, I used commas like uh, Johnny Appleseed. I, I would throw commas all over the place out there. And he's like, why do you use so many commas? And I, and I was like, well, when I read, whenever I feel like there's a pause, boom, I put a comma in there. Uh, but, so I was terrible at punctuation. Grammar is something I was horrible at. And it's, for today, you know, grammar is not necessarily used in the Twitterverse, right? So, uh, I, so there's a lot of people who share my uh, um, dislike for grammar. But we know that it is so important in a written language, in the written language. Grammar, punctuation, all of these things, the verb tense, exactly what does it mean. All of it is so important. And for many years of my life, I would just gloss over that, paying no attention to it, and missing the deeper meaning of what God has for us in His Word. And so, yes, in my older years, I have more of an appreciation for grammar. I have more of an appreciation for punctuation and verb tenses and what have you. And I heard this on the radio, this passage of Scripture in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 8, 17 and 18. And they were talking about this verb, be filled. And they were saying that in this tense, in this verb tense, it, was a, it is a command, but it was given in a passive voice. Stay with me, I know. My eyes would tend to start glossing over at this point also. <laughs> what this means though, because it, it flummoxes me. What this passage of Scripture here is, is it's a command of something you're supposed to do, but it needs to be done to you and for you. So it is something I have to do. This is a command. Be filled is a command. Every bit is a, of the command in 1 Corinthians 6 and 18, which is the next one, Drew. Flee sexual immorality is a command. Or Colossians chapter 4, verse 2. Devote yourselves to prayer with an alert mind and a thankful heart. It's a command. Be filled is every bit is of a command. But it's given in the passive voice tense. An active voice tense is used to describe something you're supposed to be actively doing. But the passive voice tense describes something that is done to you or for you. I looked it up. It's the difference between these verse, these, these sentences. Clean the room or room be cleaned. Right? We, we, we know there's a bit of a difference. In Crystal's, in Crystal's t uh, uh, world, it would be kill the spider or spider be killed. <laughs> Bank account be filled. Right? So that's the difference between the active voice tense and the passive voice tense. So we have here a, a command to us in Scripture, something that we're supposed to do, but we can't do. Is that clear as mud? <laughs> Author Michael Kelly, he had an illustration that kind of helped me understand some of this. And he, he likes boats. And so he used several different types of boats to, to describe what's going on here with this command of be filled with the Spirit. What's this all about? 
So he says, first think of the rowboat, right? A rowboat is active. The distance you travel depends solely on the effort that you provide. And you can go anywhere until you are tired, and then you stop rowing, and then all of your forward momentum quits. So we get that. I don't know how many of us have rowed a boat, but you, you tend to get more tired quicker than you, you think you will. Uh, we used to do canoes and stuff and camp, and where you get in there and you think, ah, oh, I'm after a little while out on the on the on the lake, it's time to time to go back in. Crystal likes to kayak. We got to do some of that yesterday. You can feel the burn when you're when you're rowing and paddling. So that's the rowboat. You guys get that? It's a active. It's something you actively do. It depends on your effort. It depends on your strength. And when you're tired, all of the momentum stops. Then he says the next thing we need to think of is the bass boat. In this situation, all you do is just turn on the key, rev the thing up, and go. Hold on to the steering wheel. Some bass boats can travel up to 100 miles per hour on the water. Very little effort is required. And so we have a rowboat Christians. These are the ones who think that the Christian walk is all about their effort. It's all about the doing. It's all you do this, you don't do that. You do this, you don't do that. Their Christian walk is all about their effort. When they advise people, it's all about, well, you need to be doing this. You need to be doing that. It's all based upon their effort. These are rowboat Christians. They roll up their sleeves. They're determined All the blessings that they get are based upon how hard you try. Bass boat Christians, they give very little effort. These are the Christians that come to church on Sunday. About the only time they ever get into God's Word is what they get from the preacher on Sunday. Then they go back home and they go back to work or they go back to school. They live their life as if they never heard anything from from the, the, the preacher on Sunday, and then they come back to Sunday and they get a little bit more. Very little effort. They have, they are devoid of personal disciplines or real commitment to their faith. And he says the sailboat. Sailboat is the best analogy to the Christian walk. There's a couple of factors that contribute to the forward momentum of a sailboat. One, the sail must be positioned in a place to receive the wind. And two, the wind has to be blowing. (laughs) The wind has to be blowing. No wind, no movement. A sailor's job is to to position the sail in the correct position in order to receive the wind. This maneuver is called tacking. And so as the sailor tacks its sail to the boat, it, it positions itself. There's effort. There's some work involved on the sailor's part to put the sail in the perfect position to catch the wind. The wind blows forward momentum with the sailboat. The forward motion of the sailboat is based exclusively on catching the wind. No wind, no motion. And you can't control the wind. You can't control the wind. You can't see the wind. But you can put yourself in a position to receive the wind. This helps me understand what this verb tense be filled means. So we can't and we don't make ourselves be filled with the Spirit, but we can make ourselves available to the Spirit. We can put ourselves in a position to catch the wind of the Spirit. See, these little obediences that we, we do throughout our day, we choose to take time to praise and worship Him. We choose 
to take time to study and to meditate on His Word. We choose to take time to pray and, and commune and have a relationship with our Father. When we do these things, we are positioning our sail to be in a place where when the wind blows, we catch it. See, being filled, this verb, what this is all about, what this is all about, it's about yielding to the Lord. It's about submitting full control to the Lord. That's what it's about. Many times, and, and no, it's not, it's not bad to, to have fear and to have anxiety, but many times in my life, I've recognized in my life, when I'm experiencing these moments, it's because I'm willing to let go of something, I'm willing to... To, uh, unwilling to submit to what the Lord wants me to do, I'm trying to control the situation. And so if I'm in charge, if I'm in control of the situation, it's going to be messed up, which means I have everything to fear. <laughs> but submitting, yielding control to the Lord, we set our sail, trust the Holy Spirit, surrender control to Him, and that's why here, I believe here in, in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 17 through 18, I don't know, yeah, if you want to go back to that, thank you. That's why Paul contrasts drunkenness with being filled with the Spirit. Verse 18, do not get drunk on wine which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Abusing alcohol yields a person's self-control and judgment to the negative effects of the alcohol. They yield themselves to that. We know because many times they do something stupid, and I always hear the reason, well, I was drunk. <laughs> and that's their excuse, why they did that. Why, and that's why we should absolve them, right? They yielded the control their self-control, and their judgment to the negative effects of alcohol. That's why Paul contrasts drunkenness with the Spirit. But being filled with the Spirit, we yield the direction of our lives to God and His control. That's what being filled means. Yielding our direction, yielding our desires, yielding everything about us to Him, submitting to Him, Doing these little things, these spiritual disciplines. We pray, we fast, we read, meditate on His Word, we study, we do all those things. As we do those things, we're positioning our sail in a place so that when the Spirit moves, when the Spirit blows, you're there to catch it and go where He wants you to go. And for all of this, I want you to keep this sailboat imagery in our minds as we move into the fruit. As we move into the fruit. I thought about hey, maybe the title should be Sailboats and Fruit Trees, but we got <laughs> I wanted to I was going to have big objects up here, you know. <laughs> no, let's tap the brakes. Tap the brakes. <laughs> Sometimes Crystal's the one who does that for me. But it sets us up for the fruit. As we're talking about being filled with the Spirit and the fruit of the Spirit. What's this going to look like? What does this mean as we go through each of the fruit? As we yield control to the Spirit, what does this mean? Well, let's go to Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 through 33. And it's cutting some of it off, so I've got it right here, though. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. I haven't gotten rid of this idea yet, but the kids, they have a song that they sing about this. And so as we go through the fruit of the Spirit, Savannah, I haven't told you yet. I may ask the kids to come up here and teach us that song. <laughs> Drew, he was in camp, he... And I don't know if you were a, a worker or a camper, but he knows the song. He sings it all the time. <laughs> I'm thinking, man, I would like to know that song because my uh, memorization skills have 
faded with time, and it's hard for me to memorize some things, but teach me a song, I've got it down. But the fruit of the Spirit is all of these things, these blessings, these, these attitudes, these characteristic traits of a believer. And I always thought, as a young person, that word, the word fruit, always confused me. Fruit of the Spirit. It, I didn't understand what, what Paul was talking about, or, or even when Jesus was talking about, you will know them by their fruit. And, and, and fruit was a confusing word to me. I mean, I understood the word fruit. I love watermelon. I, lo- I understand the, the, the fruit, but I didn't, didn't mean or understand what the word fruit of the Spirit meant. It was confusing to me. To me, as a younger person, I felt maybe it should be called more like the works, the works of the Spirit, because the Spirit is at work in every single one of us all the time. It should be the works of the Spirit. That makes more sense to me. Because this is what the Spirit is working on in me. He who started a good work in me, He's going to finish it. So why did He use the word fruit? It was confusing to me. But you need to read the list just before the fruit. Verse 19 through 21. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties and other sins like these, let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. In the New King James Version, it says, now the works of the flesh are evident. And so for, for me To say that this should be the works of the Spirit kind of negates exactly what Paul is trying to do here. He has two lists and he's drawing a distinction between the two. Okay? So we have here works of the flesh and fruit of the Spirit. So I think if Paul were to use works of the Spirit, he would confuse a whole lot of people here. Works of the flesh, works of the Spirit. Understand there's a distinction, but there's so much of the distinction, Paul did not want to use the same word. Words matter. They matter. There's uh, the Jehovah's Witness in the, in the first chapter of John they added one letter, one letter, and it changed the entire meaning of the entire Scripture to book. And the Word was God, and then they added a God. Words matter. Words matter, and so it's important for us when we're reading His Word, and it's difficult because there are what? Five million translations now, right? And so sometimes, and and that's why I encourage the young people, when you're studying God's Word, look at all kinds of different translations because the Lord will speak to you in in one version that maybe didn't didn't reach you so much in another. My friend Don, he's, he's he's like that when we do our Bible study at Poplar Court. He's got a Bible that's got, what, like four or five different versions right there in front of you. So it's hard when we have so many different translations, but words matter. So what are we going on? What's going on here in the context of of this scripture? Works. Works of the flesh. It's talking about when we try to rely on our own strength. When we try to follow according to our own desires our own preferences, works of the flesh, relies, is talking about us relying on our own determination to get things done. And as we rely on ourselves, as we follow the pattern of our heart or the desires of our heart, the results of us living our life that way is that disastrous list that Paul gives us. It's based upon our own efforts and what is produced if left to our own desires or preferences or our own strength. The rowboat. This is what we get. 
But see, it's kind of tempting for some of us when we read Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 through 23, and we're reading the fruit of the Spirit, it's kind of tempting to be reading this and thinking that God is telling me that I need to try hard and work at being good. I need to try to work at being loving and patient and good. And on the surface, that sounds noble, but that misses the whole point why Paul used works of the flesh, and fruit of the Spirit. And negates the whole purpose. See, God is not telling us to put more effort into doing good things. He's telling us to yield our will to His. His definition of what is good. His definition of what is love. His def- You know, love is, is in the English language is one of the most misunderstood words ever. I think we all know that, right? And it's because everybody has their own definition of what love is. But to the Christian, to the child of God, we yield our definition to these terms to Him. We yield our will, we yield everything to Him. And the fruit just comes out from the Spirit that is within all of us. It's about yielding. Remember the sail. It's about raising the sail to catch the wind. Yielding to Him. So we have here in Matthew chapter 12 when Jesus was kind of to a breaking point with the Pharisees. And He says, A tree is identified by its fruit. If a tree is good, its fruit will be good. If a tree is bad, its fruit will be bad. You brood of snakes, how could evil men like you speak what is good and right? For whatever is in your heart determines what you say. A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart. And an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. And I tell you this, you must give an account on on judgment day for every idle word you speak. The words you say will either acquit you or condemn you. Words matter. Words matter. And we're kind of careless sometimes with words. So Jesus got to a point with the Pharisees. They were evil. They did not have a relationship. They did not love the Lord. They loved the law. But see, the Pharisees' problem wasn't that they were liars. It wasn't that they had lust. It wasn't that they were thieves. It wasn't that they were tying huge burdens around other people's necks. Those were the symptoms The Pharisees' problem was that they were the wrong tree. They were the wrong tree. And out of that tree came out evil fruit. I saw a post. I don't have much uh, love for Facebook, but there are some good posts on Facebook. And I saw one just recently. It was by a a saved, born-again former lesbian. Some of you may have seen this post, and it spoke to my heart. And she shared about her life before, how how she loved her sin. She loved her sin. And she embraced the fact that she was going to be judged and that she was going to hell. And she embraced this, this saying that they say that I was born this way. I was born this way. And she said, though, as she was reading Scripture, the Lord spoke to her. And she said, that's why Jesus said we must be born again. Because we have all been born into sin. All of us have been born with a slight bend to rebel against Him. Every single one of us. Gay, straight, liars, truth tellers. Whoever you are, we have all been born into sin. And we need to be born again. In John chapter 3, verse 3, if you want to go and read that. He says, Jesus, he did, we like to qualify our statements. We like to qualify our statements. You know, you, you read here what Jesus says. I tell you, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Other versions say you must be born again. You, he doesn't say, well, it's a good idea if you would just be born again. He doesn't say, you know what, your life would be a little easier if you would be born again. He said, you must be born again. You must. 
And that's what the biblical metaphor of the fruit is all about. Just as edible fruit is a reflection of what kind of tree it is on. The fruit of the Spirit is a reflection of who we are as children of God. We all know this. Even, even our children, we can bring them in here and ask, ask some of them questions. They will understand this premise. That if you have an orange tree, and I love oranges, so I'm not saying it's of the flesh, but I'm using this as an example, right? So if you have an orange tree of the flesh, but what you want is an apple tree of the Spirit, we know the solution is to not just go and pick all the oranges off of the orange tree. See, I think this is a good picture of what happens to a lot of our young people when they come to camp. They come to the Lord and they give Him their sin and they give Him their guilt and they give Him all of the grief that that stuff comes with, but they don't yield their life to Jesus. They don't change. They haven't given everything to Him. They've only gone part of the way. What they've done, what we as adults have done too, guys, is we've gone in there and we've taken all the oranges off of the tree and we feel good about that. But nothing has really changed because we know that the orange tree is only going to produce more oranges. And so we get, we get stuck in this cycle. And what we tried to, to help with our kids understand this year is we all, we all know this. Those of you who have gone to church camp, you know this about the church camp high. And you come back home and you're two weeks, man, you're on fire for God. And then after two weeks, you're back to where you were before. It's because... You've never really got rid of the orange tree. And the orange tree is just going to produce more oranges. We never submitted to him. We never called him Savior. See, even kids would know that it, just to get rid of the oranges isn't going to change the orange tree. N another not solution is to pick all the oranges off, go to an apple tree, take all of those apples and try to glue and staple them to the branches of the orange tree. Even the children will know. What are you doing? What are you doing? And it, That's another thing, attempt that we try to make. We try to make everything outside look good, right? We try to make everything on the outside look good and holy, and I'm a follower. But we know in Matthew chapter 7, that individual fooled himself they cast out demons they taught class they went to church they did important great things but they weren't a believer he didn't know them and so we know that's not a solution either so jesus was telling the pharisees what he's telling us today when we come to christ for salvation we accept his sacrifice on our behalf and we give and yield our life completely over to him we yield completely to the holy spirit and the spirit digs out that old tree and plants a new one see the pharisees could not say anything good because they were basing that definition of good upon themselves and upon their works and upon their efforts. And so Jesus is saying, you're not, you can't even say anything good because you're an orange tree of the flesh. And the only thing an orange tree of the flesh is going to produce is oranges of the flesh. But until we yield and change and give all of that over to Him and allow the Spirit to plant the new tree in us, we will continue to press or produce oranges of the flesh. Listen, listen to this fruit that comes from the tree, the new tree that gets planted inside of us from the Spirit. Listen to this fruit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, self-control. To a group of people 
who are living in fear and a group of people who are living in anxiety. And I say living there. I'm not saying experiencing it from time to time. I'm saying living there. Listen to the fruit that comes from the Spirit that is within every believer that is submitting their yield or yielding their control to the Lord. Rick and Karen, if you're ready. Something we need to also understand, and I know some people have mentioned this, and, and we've read this, and we know this. It's the fruit of the Spirit. Not fruits. It's important for us to know that. See, I think we understand and realize that there are gifts that the Spirit gives, and not everybody is going to be a preacher. Not everybody is going to be a worship leader. Not everybody is going to be a children's church teacher. Not everybody is an encourager. Not everybody has all of that. And so sometimes when we approach this fruit of the Spirit, we tend to think we can pick and choose from that as well. But no, it's a package deal. It comes from the Spirit. It's a one thing. We can't not hide behind our personality and say, well, I'm just not a patient person, so oh well. Person who says that, and I've said it to Crystal many times, is not yielding control of their heart and their life to the Spirit. As we go through the fruit, let us dig deep into what the Lord is telling us, to what is inside of you right now if you are a believer in Christ. If you're not a believer, let today be the day. And let this be the first day where you begin your walk and we begin to discover what the fruit looks like in my life. You see, you're going to see that it's a blessing. You're going to see that it's power. You're going to see that it is something so different from what this world has to offer. We will think to ourselves, why, why, why did I even mess with the stuff in this world? All the stuff of the flesh. Yes, it, it looks good and it makes us feel good for a while, but it doesn't compare to the fruit of the Spirit. It's not even a comparison. If you aren't a believer, let's, 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 let's have that conversation. And let's come to the Lord. If you are a believer, but you have maybe done some self-inventory, maybe the Spirit's speaking to you and, and He's letting you know, hey, you've given me this part, but you haven't given me this part. Let today be the day where we yield it all to Him. Because we have a command to be filled. That command does require some effort. It does require for us to be available and open and obedience to yield. So the altars will be open. If the Spirit is moving on you to come forward, do it. He's, he's putting that on your heart for a reason. So stop hiding behind some of our comfort stuff. We've come here, we've come here to pursue the Lord. Don't stop at your seat. Don't stop there. Let's pray. Let's pray. Let's pray. It's hard, but we need to wrap our minds around this concept. The apple tree is not an apple tree because it produces apples. It produces apples because it's an apple tree. See, it's the difference, it's the difference between doing and being. We, we get caught up in the doing because literally we're doing. We're walking to the people's houses and we're speaking and sharing Jesus. So we're doing. And so we get lost and we get caught up in this concept of the doing and the being. But we need to understand people don't go to hell. Because they have sin in their hearts. They go to hell because they don't know Jesus who can take the sin away. It's all about the relationship. It's all about the being. The being. So be available. Be ready 
with your sail to catch the wind of the Holy Spirit by faith. By faith. Be willing to yield your will to His by faith. And let's obey the command to be filled with the Spirit by faith.